ways to make a successful medical school application, or at least five things you need to think about to begin that process. So I'm approaching this from the point of view of we're just thinking about making this decision. Okay, we don't quite know exactly what we want to do with our lives. Okay, but medicine is an option. So medicine might be an option to you if you know you're thinking of um, working in a working in healthcare, or if you're thinking about, if you're studying science A-levels, and you're thinking about uh, choosing a degree in a, in a science subject, um, or you like to work with people, or you, you are a naturally kind of compassionate and empathetic person, and you want to share those, those values with others, and you might be starting to think um, that an application to a medical school to train to be a doctor is the thing for you. Big undertaking, it, just to get you um, to zero to get you through the door on the first day is a five or six year degree program. It's a big life commitment, especially when we're talking about nine thousand pounds a year in tuition fees. You've got to really, really know that it's for you and know that it's the decision that you want to make. So, what we're going to look at here are five things for you to think about um, before you before you set off on that on that journey. Okay. Oh, okay. if you don't know who I am, that's me, I'm John. We all know by. Right, so this is my number one, okay? Ensure that you truly understand the career. Because many people think that they know what a career in medicine will be like. Many people have an idea of what, of, of what that career might be like. That might be based on a relative who works in the same or a similar field, okay? They see that person doing their job and they seem to be reasonably happy in their work. I think, oh, okay, you know, Uncle Sam so is a doctor, so I might go and follow, his, follow in his footsteps. Some people think, you know, I want to be a doctor or a dentist or, you know, these um, healthcare professions because I've seen, um, well, it used to be George Clooney on ER, but that's sort of showing my age a little bit. With, you know, whatever. You know, we've seen it on the television and you've got, uh, it's quite a glamorous career and you're getting, Children rushed into the emergency ward, and like the doctor is there, and he's, and he's bringing people, reviving people from their last and their last breath. It looks very exciting and very glamorous, and it's still came out it's all in the day's work, all that kind of thing. I don't quite appreciate perhaps that the life of a doctor is not necessarily always as kind of exciting and as bad as that is. Next of all, you've got to think about what that career is actually going to involve for you day to day. You never ever hear, um, very, very rarely do you hear a good news story about, about, about medicine. We've got some, what are the medical stories in the news right now, anybody? Medical stories? Junior doctors. Yeah. Junior doctors, okay, junior doctors are on strike, so whichever side of that fence you, you sit on politically, this is not a political discussion, but uh, you can drive past Ealing Hospital and you can see the junior doctors on their picket line on certain, certain days of the week, okay, they've been doing that. and. Um, Another, another, there's a medical science story in the news right now. It's related to a big sporting event that's coming up. Zika the Zika virus. Okay, there's two, two things that are in the news right now. We've got um, uh, two, two big issues. They're not really very good. They're not, they're not heartwarming stories. They're stories of worry and concern, and tragedy and difficulty. Okay? So it's very rare that you hear a news story that, that says, you know. Uh, Mrs. So-and-so today, she needed her appendix removed and she went to hospital and the doctor removed it and then the next day she went home. And then another patient came in and then the next day she went home. You don't really hear these types of stories, but that is what being a doctor is. It's doing very difficult work under, under pressure very, very well every day for very little thanks or recognition. Okay? We we'll really understand what we're in for before we're choosing this career. Who gets ill? Which people get ill? Well, we all get ill. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's true. Well, hopefully not too often. But and if you if you go to a, if you go to a hospital, if you go to a hospital ward, you'll generally see uh, two groups of people are very well represented. Who are they? Old and middle aged. The el middle aged. Pediatrics and geriatrics. Yes. Yeah. Very the very elderly and the very very young. Okay. They're the people in society who, who, who get ill. Okay. So very very. Um, uh, young children are susceptible to infection and, um, and think probably have problems early in life. And then, of course, the older we get, the, we're all living longer these days in the population, but the more problems we pick up. Okay? 
And those two people are often not the best groups of people to work with day to day, for uh, reasons that you might be able to imagine. So sometimes it's difficult being a doctor, you difficulties. It's all about communication. It's the number one skill that a lot of people say in their medical school interviews. Is it's about communication. The one thing that a doctor, the skill that a doctor should have. In fact, it's actually quite difficult to communicate with a three-month-old or a 103-year-old. <laughs> okay, there are certain there are certain communication barriers. So <clears throat> we've got to know what we're know what we're getting ourselves in for. Okay. And lastly, of course, is when you go if you're ill or you're injured or you've broken a leg. Um, or you, you know, you're in a generally bad way, and you go to hospital, and you've got to wait for six hours in reception just to be seen by a doctor, and then you've got to wait for another four hours to be seen by the relevant one, and then they tell you to wait, and then they might they like shove you around and push you and prod you and tell you that they're actually not really sure what's up. By then, you're in a really bad mood. Okay, so by a lot of a lot of encounters that doctors will have with their patients are with people who are really not at their best. Okay, really in a very bad way, annoyed, irritable, irritated, uh, in pain, in discomfort. And these can be, you've got to make sure you've got the skills to, to handle all these different, all these different um, experiences. So that's number one. Do you 100% know what you're getting yourself in for? Okay? So, it's related to point number two. Go and see it for yourself and see other careers too. Nobody actually knows that they definitely want to be a doctor or a dentist. You don't know. You have an idea that it's right for you, and that's obviously where you've got to start. But unless you go and see it and find out for yourself, you will never truly know. Okay? So you need to spend some time, not just working, not just in a hospital, or not just in a doctor's surgery, but go and experience what it's like to work with and be alongside those groups of people that I mentioned. Elderly people, very young people, people in a bad mood. Um, I don't know where you find them on a day-to-day -day basis, but you know you can. Um, and of course, go and volunteer, in a, volunteer in, a, in a hospital or get some work experience. Absolutely vital. Okay, so I'd say my, my two sort of bucket list things that every single aspiring medic should do is one, get some kind of work experience. Go and shadow a doctor if you can, or a nurse, or a GP, or work in a GP surgery. It's very difficult to get into a hospital. Okay? It's not the be all and end all. Or go and speak to someone if you have a family member, or if you know someone who knows someone, go and spend some time with them a day, a week, whatever you can. But then, more importantly, go and get some experience of volunteering in an old folks home, something like that, or in a charity shop, okay? or on a long term basis. So, week by week, day by day, you meet these people, you see them, and you get to learn how to communicate, you get to understand what their needs and requirements are. So, go see it, and of course, go and see other stuff as well. So you might, you know, you're good at biology, you're good at chemistry, you're good at maths, you know, medicine is a career for me, but equally, you might want to consider, if you've ever considered a career in um, biomedical science, or uh, biochemistry, or some sort of engineering, or being a research scientist, I mean, you've got to experience lots of different things. You can't truly know what you want to do until you know what you don't want to do. So, the more experience you can get of lots of different careers and lots of different university um, degrees, if you do all of that and you still want to be a doctor, then you know that you've made the choice for the right reason. Okay? So there we go. Number one, make sure you truly understand. Number two, go and see it for yourself. Go and find it. Don't take anybody else's word for it. Go and find out for yourself what the, what the job and the career really is then. Okay. The next is this. Okay, moving research. Um, beginning a lifetime of learning. This is a really key point now. So, if you enter a medical school in 2017, which would be the situation that you'll be in, by 2022-23, you'd be looking at completing your degree. Okay, and then there's two, three years more studying to do. Okay, and then possibly at that stage you'll be ready to become the lowest doctor on the rung. Okay, the, the junior doctor, the person who does all the difficult shifts on the on the, the accident and emergency ward, all the night shifts, all the long hours. So we're looking at ten years down the line, potentially, by the time you've got one year under your belt. Okay? 
And that's just the beginning. And then you start. Okay, then you start to learn. Then you start to really understand your career after that. Um, doctors have to take regular exams. They have to study. They have to be researchers as well as um, as well as practitioners. Okay, so this is a good habit to start now. Start understanding and learning that you're going to you're going to be studying and reading and researching for the rest of your career until you retire. And the research you can do now is critical in helping you gain a place in medical school in a year's time, in two years time, whenever it, whenever it is for you. Because you can start to read around your subject and learn and understand what's happening in the world of medicine right now. So we mentioned two things in the room already. The Zika virus in South America and Brazil, junior doctors are on strike. Okay? But those two things are in the news. Okay? If I turn on the radio, radio on Five Live in the car in the morning, one of those two things in the news bulletin will come up. So what else do you know? And the first thing that an interviewer might ask you if you get that far in your application is, okay, so you've done your A-level in biology, you've done your A-level in chemistry, so tell me what, what else do you know? What, tell me like, something that, you, that you've been reading lately, or did you see the article about such and such a thing? And it's a great feeling if you did read the article, or you did hear about the story, okay? So we start now. Never before has there been more information available and never before have people chosen not to access it on such a level. It's, it's very easy. We get spoon-fed the news that we want to see. Okay? Our news comes from our Facebook friends' news feed. Okay? Or I don't know, if you've got the news app on your iPhone, it gives you the news that it, your phone thinks you want to read about. Okay? It's, it's your own personal news, it's your own personal window on the world. It's, just, it's directing you towards things that uh, it's assuming you're interested in. But what else is there? What journal have you read? Every aspiring med medic should uh, subscribe immediately to the junior British uh, medical journal, the junior BM BMJ. Pick, the, pick up a copy of that each week and have a flip through. Okay? Um, the New Scientist is a good place to start for science stories, although it's very journalistically written. Okay? You might want to look at something like Nature magazine or Science magazine to see what's really, what's really happening out there. So many blogs and um, uh, places on the internet where you can find information. But you have to know where to look, and you have to look, and you have to look very carefully and read it very critically. Well, who's writing this article? Who's writing this blog? Okay. Where, what, what's their position? What's their vested interest? And if I were writing the opposite argument here, what would I, what would I think about that? So you've got a summer ahead. Once you finish your final exam, you've got two to three months. You never have that period again in your life until you retire. Okay? of freedom to absorb information and to go looking for stuff that's going to really help you out in, your, in, in, in making your, in your decision. And it will help you to get into good habits. So, here's my fourth point. Okay? Find something that makes you special. Everybody has something that makes them unique, that makes them special. And the reason I say this is because um, if you look at really good quality applications to universities, to medical schools in particular. They are full of captains of football teams, grade eight violinists, people who've done the Duke of Edinburgh's Gold Award, people who've done work experience here, work experience there, uh, head boys, head girls, full of them. To the point where it's almost becoming a cliche, the point where it's almost becoming a, well, everybody's done it. Everyone's got the gold, gold award in, in the Duke of Edinburgh. Everyone's captained their football, rugby, cricket, swimming, athletics, insert subject, insert sport there. Okay. Now, I'm not saying don't do those things. You definitely do as much of those things as you can. Take as much opportunity from life as you possibly can. But I, you need to tell the medical school about something about yourself. What is the thing about yourself that makes you a special individual. Now, and that will come from the experiences that you get from your, uh, from your reading and from your work experience and from your activities. So yes, I captained the football team, but also there was a member of the team and he was being uh, bullied by people you know, higher up in the school. So part of my responsibility as team captain was to build the confidence of that individual and to have him believe that he was a, that he was a, a keen participant in my team and an important member of my colleague and they should, 
stand up for himself a little more and he can express himself on the sports field and that way that will be a way of helping him to overcome the, uh, the challenges he was experiencing in his life. That makes you special. That makes you, that means you, that, that, that's showing you've got a skill that you can share with other people, okay? Other than a very generic one that lots of other people will say. So what is the one thing in your life, and I can't tell you what makes you special, I've no idea, but there'll be something. There'll be something that you can find that makes you unique. So, point number five, form proofs that we have this area. To get into, to qualify as a doctor, or to gain entry into medical school, you need to think. decide that it's right for you. You need to undertake work experience and, vol and volunteering. Very, you won't get an application, if, uh, you won't make a successful application if you haven't got that on there somewhere. You then need to write a strong, application, strong personal statement. You have to take an exam, okay, either the UK CAT or the BMAT, the two current um, additional entrance exams that exist for medicine right now. Then you might get an interview, um, to point number five already, you might be interviewed. Then you have to have what they call the uh, non-academic qualifications, okay, so you're not allowed to be a criminal and <laughs> You have to have, so you have to do a criminal records check, and you've got to have your health check, okay? And we call that six and seven. And these are actually quite big hoops to jump through. These are quite big barriers to get over. It is difficult to find the work experience. It is difficult to write a good application. It's difficult to be interviewed. Each interview, each university might interview in a completely different way, and you've got to prepare for each one. And you've got to keep all the reading and research going. And then, and only then, if you're lucky, you get an offer from a university that says, congratulations, you can join our medical school if you get A-level grades of A star, A star, A. You think, God, I've done all that work, and I've still got to get A star, A star, A. It's like, you know, I'm already exhausted. <laughs> done all of that stuff. My interviews have been spread out over a period of three to four months. My, you know, my, my exams are way off in the distance, or so it seems. And I've still got to achieve. So, but that's what it takes. And if your offer is A star, A star, A, and you get A star, A, A, you don't get in. Because the, you know, the pressure is so tight on those applications. There's so many people who want that place. Somebody will get the grades. If you don't get them, somebody will get them. So, it is essential to form good study habits now. Okay? It comes back to read, research, practice now. Um, people study in different ways, people learn in different ways. It's not a, it's not a learning and teaching skills uh, seminar. But you will find a way that works for you, so that helps you to remember very large amounts of, in, of information. And remember, to get an A star and an A level, you have to know pretty much everything. And you have to express it almost perfectly. So the margin for error is very, very small. So you need to develop that study habit right now that will help you to get those grades that you need. Because you'll need to you need to study habits because six-year medical school degree is blinking difficult <coughs> and you've got to keep studying all through your career. So develop the study habits now. And if you do, the grades will take care of themselves. So, they're my top five things to think about before you decide to embark upon an application to medical school. And I say medical school, but I include their dentistry as well and other... Um, one of a better expression, leading medical sciences, medical sciences careers. Okay? They're my top five things to think about now. And these are all things that you can start thinking about today and in June, July, August, whilst you're lying on your beach on holiday, sipping pina coladas, whatever you're going to do on the summer holidays. Um, because there are things that you can put in place and begin right away. Okay? Once you've made the decision, then we'll have another talk because then the, the things that you need to do then are different. Mm -hmm. So, I think I've said everything that I want to say. Have I got a question slide? I do have a question slide. What do you want to talk about? What do we want to talk about? We can, ask, we can discuss anything to do with medical school applications, university application, uh, or any of the five things that I've mentioned. 
or I've given you all the information you need and you don't need, need to ask me any questions. Yeah. So what type of work experience do you need? Right, that's a very good question. So, um, it's useful if you can go and see medicine being done in the workplace. So you can go into a doctor's surgery or into a hospital and spend some time on an emergency ward, which is extremely difficult work experience to get. But all of that is very difficult work experience to get, unless you know someone. Okay? So I would say a much more valuable work experience is a long-term placement. It's something that you've done every Saturday morning for six months. You've gone into your local care home for, for the elderly and you've just helped to speak with the, speak to the patients and look after them and make them tea and converse with them. That's much more valuable than two to three days of work shadowing. It's not that two to three days of work shadowing is not important, but that's a really useful thing to have. It shows that, you've got, that you're prepared to put in a regular commitment, that you're prepared to give up your own time in the pursuit of your, of your career and to help others. Charity shop? And work in your local volunteer in your local charity shop on a Sunday morning, why not? I would certainly do that. That's interactive with the public. Um, teach you a lot, of, a lot of new skills as well. Work in McDonald's. Okay, I told you people are in a bad mood. People are always in a bad mood in McDonald's. Okay, find out what you get used to being sworn at and shouted at and harassed and harangued and working under pressure and all of those things. Yeah. McDonald's, Starbucks, perfect opportunities to learn those skills. <laughs> okay. Let's leave it there then. Do you want to play out your forms for me?